Welcome everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Linda Sonnen, Manager of Public Programs at Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center. On behalf of our CEO, Susan Abrams, Board of Directors, staff and volunteers, I am honored to welcome you to today's Lunch and Learn. The Illinois Holocaust Museum's founding principle is remember the past, transform the future. In keeping with these principles, we are fortunate to have Professor Young with us to share his deep knowledge and insights about public memorial art and communal remembrance. Before I formally introduce today's renowned speaker, a few announcements. First, we'd like to thank our community partners listed on our introductory slides for their continued support. Today's speaker, Professor James E. Young, is the Distinguished University Professor Emeritus of English and Judaica and Near Eastern Studies and Founding Director of the Institute for Holocaust, Genocide and Memory Studies at University of Massachusetts Amherst. He has authored several books, including The Stages of Memory, Reflections on Art, Loss and the Spaces in Between, upon which today's presentation is based. Professor Young has written widely on public art, memorials, and national memory. His articles, reviews, and op-ed pieces have appeared in dozens of scholarly journals and international newspapers. <laughs> His CV is brimming with major awards, honors, and fellowships. In 1997, Professor Young was appointed by the Berlin Senate to the jury that chose Peter Eisenman's design for Germany's national memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe was dedicated in May 2005. He has also consulted with Argentina's government on its memorial to the Desaparacitos, as well as with numerous city agencies on their memorials and museums. Most recently, Young was appointed to the jury for the National 9-11 Memorial Design Competition won by Michael Arad and Peter Walker in 2004 and opened on September 11th, 2011. Professor Young, we are thrilled to have you here with us today. Uh, it's great to be here, although I'd rather be there <laughs> yeah, with you in, in uh, Illinois, in Skokie. Um, thanks so much for having me <clears throat> and uh, asking me to share some of my thoughts on you know, what I've come to call the stages of memory. <clears throat> um, I'd like to start with uh, the story of our uh, announcement of the national uh, September 11th uh, memorial. Um, as Linda mentioned, we, uh, I was appointed to the jury along with Maya Lynn <clears throat> and Michael Van Valkenburg and a handful of uh, others. There were 13 of us uh, altogether. In uh, March 2003, we deliberated um, over some 5,201 designs from 62 countries <clears throat> um, over the course of about nine months, finally making our selection of Michael Rod and Peter Walker's uh, beautiful design uh, called Reflecting Absence. Uh, two uh, gigantic uh, reflecting uh, ponds in the uh, basins of the footprints of the former World Trade Center towers, uh, each about 35 deep, each with a further void uh, at their centers, uh, going down it, all the way to bedrock. Um, eventually, a museum was built underneath, uh, but the memorial itself opened on uh, the 10th anniversary of the September 11 uh, attacks uh, in, uh, this, on September 11, 2011. But on that January morning, when we announced the winning design, um, uh, until then, we weren't allowed to take any questions or talk to the press. We were completely sequestered uh, for all those months. <clears throat> um, but once we announced the design, uh, we were then fair game. And uh, the very first question I got uh, was by uh, an intrepid reporter, uh, who's become a very well-known reporter, Nathaniel Popper, uh, who asked me, um, well, Professor Young, uh, obviously you were on the jury for the Denkmal. 
Uh, you chose the Eisenman design. You've worked closely with Danny Liebeskind at the Jewish Museum, and you've written at length about counter monuments and negative four monuments. Can you um, tell me um, that basically, haven't you just chosen as a jury um, yet one more Holocaust memorial design, this time for the September 11th attacks? And I was a little taken aback, um, even slightly offended, but I began to kind of pull together an answer. And um, the answer I ended up you know, giving him was, well, in fact, um, this isn't a Holocaust memorial. It's very much a September 11th uh, memorial you know, to the victims. But we, we chose this design uh, because it uh, recalled both absence with these huge voids and the regeneration of life with these beautiful plazas of trees. The taller the trees grow, the deeper the volumes of the voids become very much of a, they, they complement each other very well that way. So the system of memorial that remembers only loss, but also remembers life with life, you know, in the, in the trees. And I said, so it's, it's not a Holocaust memorial, but in fact, all of art and architecture, um, you know, in contemporary moment has certainly been inflected by memory of the Holocaust. Um, I would suggest music, literature, history writing, um, uh, clearly art and architecture are all informed by uh, the artists and kind of the, the culture makers um, awareness of the terrible unredeemable losses during the Holocaust. And so um, as I was kind of coming up with this answer, <clears throat> I also thought back and um, Maya Lin was on our jury and recalled that I had first met uh, Maya Lin in fact in 1988 at talks we did at the Harvard School of Design. And there she, um, reminded me, let's see, I'm going to call up one of these here. <clears throat> okay. So we're gonna share this screen. <clears throat> Um, she reminded me that, in fact, her Vietnam Veterans Memorial design uh, was inspired partly by a great memorial in um, Tipal, France, the, the, the memorial to the missing of the Battle of the Somme, um, but also by another great memorial, one of the very earliest Holocaust memorials on the Idelicite in Paris, the memorial to the deported Jews um, of France, designed by Henri Pinguchon. Um, that she, as a junior uh, abroad, uh, in her junior year at Yale, as a young architecture student, had spent much time going and, and sitting in the midst of that, uh, she said. And she was struck by the ways that this was kind of a, a space that was, at the, at the surface, very horizontal, you know, not vertical, as you see here on the outside. Something you have to descend down a very narrow staircase to see. It's kind of carved out of the ground. And kind of with this triangular motif, there's a little bit of a triangular plaza here, um, kind of symbolic, uh, again, uh, barbed you know, wires, if you will, very sharp, uh, sharp triangular edges. And the only way you could look out of this, you know, this area <clears throat> carved out of the ground. Um, was to look through this grilled window <clears throat> out onto the River Seine. Across the river, if you're looking at the memorial uh, to the deported Jews of, of France, um, you see kind of what looks like a big elbow or almost like of the prow of a ship going you know, into the Seine, River Seine. Um, but from here, uh, we find ourselves inside that elbow, if you will. Um, Maya Lin came back. Uh, she took in her senior year a class by Vince Scully on <clears throat> uh, memorial design. And the whole class entered the international competition for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial to be sited on the mall in Washington, DC. And this was Maya's design. Um, this is the pastel you know, she drew. And what's striking here <clears throat> is that in this, uh, this city of you know, neoclassic white monoliths, <clears throat> um, gigantic uh, you know, columns, uh, uh, white columns, you know, she's counterpointed these traditional monuments <clears throat> with what she called a, a wound uh, in the landscape. 
She said she wanted to, it was as if taking a knife and cutting it into the landscape and then opening this wound that would actually never quite mend. You know, how is she going to articulate the memory of, a, uh, of both a war and the veteran and the, the, the American uh, soldiers who died in that war, a, a war that the country had really come to uh, abhor uh, in many ways. It was a very ambivalent kind of memory. So this was really America's first, I would call, negative form monument, and um, quite you know, brilliantly done. And that she's taken um, the ultimate counterpoint to the flying wedge, the spear, um, <clears throat> the uh, the point of an arrow, and instead of taking that very aggressive architectural form, the jutting form, she's taken its obverse space and opened it up, so that visitors now go into the embrace of this. You know, this flying triangle, this flying wedge. One axis points to the Washington Monument, the other axis points to the Lincoln Memorial, thereby integrating itself. But here she said that this wasn't going to be what she called a, um, a kind of a, a, a fixed monument. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read her words for you. <clears throat> she says, I never looked at the memorial as a wall or an object, but as an edge to the earth, an open side instead of that positive V form, you know, jutting elbow, you know, she opened up this negative space to be filled by those who come to remember. And then she said something really, really interesting in her original proposal. <clears throat> the memorial is composed not as an unchanging monument, but as a moving composition to be understood as we move into and out of it. That is, as a monument is fixed and static, her memorial will be defined by our movement through its space memory by means of perambulation and walking through. And this is part of the genius of, of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, really America's greatest uh, 20th century memorial, um, beloved uh, by, uh, by nearly all um, at this point. The only human forms in this memorial are our own reflections, um, so that they are by nature uh, very humanly proportioned. People need to walk down and out of it. And I've talked to veterans who, as they walk down into the space and then walk out of it, actually uh, recall that they seem to be entering almost the graves of their, of their comrades. But unlike their comrades uh, who stay below the earth, they're able to come out. And it's a very moving moment when they come out and their heads you know, reach above the grass there. Um, <clears throat> So Maya Lin dedicated this uh, in 1982. And within just a few years, a whole generation of young German uh, memorial designers uh, were also grappling with their almost impossible conundrum, how to remember the Holocaust you know, on a national scale. Um, nobody had ever been, uh, no country had ever asked itself how to reunite itself on the bedrock memory of its crimes. Um, you know, how to commemorate a people murdered in the national name. And yet the Germans were trying and they had a national uh, competition in 1995, uh, one which was eventually uh, voided out, um, <clears throat> which I'll discuss in a minute. But one of the uh, submissions for the very first national memorial for Europe's murdered Jews was this submission by Horst Hoheisel. He proposed taking the Brandenburger tour, Germany's national monument, and blowing it up, <clears throat> then grinding it to dust, and the dust will be spread on the area <clears throat> of this, uh, you know, of this uh, former memorial, and the area will be covered in granite pieces. Um, the memorial will basically be these two gigantic voids, a double void, <clears throat> and that would be the memorial. He would remember one terrible destruction with yet another terrible destruction this time at the National Monument. Um, it was also clearly a memorial that the government would never except, but that was also part of his point. He wasn't sure that there really could be a central national memorial to Europe's murdered Jews in Berlin. It was a real conundrum. Nobody had ever done that before. You know, as we discussed at the time, and eventually I uh, gave, gave a talk around there, um, uh, you know, after the, that competition was avoided, um, it became uh, very clear that I, I said, look at, um, you're trying to do something nobody else has ever done. Where in on the Washington Mall 
in Washington, D.C. Is there even a pebble commemorating the slave auctions that were once held there? There's nothing. Um, you know, our original sin in America is not commemorated anywhere near the National Mall. And of course, now we have a National Museum to African American history. We have the great uh, lynching memorial, <clears throat> the Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama. But at this time, we had nothing. And I'm pretty sure that just as I think the young German artists were learning from Maya Lin, we in turn began to learn from these young German artists over time. In 1986, uh, Jochen Gertz and Esther Lev Gertz proposed a memorial <clears throat> to, um, you know, for peace and against violence, a, a generic Holocaust memorial in Hamburg. This was to be a 12 meter tall lead column in, whereby they invited the citizens of Hamburg and visitors to add their names, you know, with a, a, a soft lead a soft lead covering and the stylus would allow them to kind of carve their names into the into the column. As more and more names cover this 12 meter lead uh, column, it will gradually be lowered into the ground and one day it will disappear completely. The site of a Harburg monument against fascism will be empty. And then what I think is maybe the most important, you know, kind of memorial uh, epigraph ever. In the end, it is only we ourselves who can rise up against injustice. That is, these memorials cannot become substitutes for action that we take. The memorials don't remember, we remember. And eventually this memorial will have disappeared and opened up space in the landscape for us to remember. And everybody, you know, think of Maya Lin carving out a space in the landscape that would open a space within us, you know, for memory. So Jochen Gerritz and Esther Shalev Gerritz here creating a memorial that would be filled theoretically with the names of passersby. Eventually, all kinds of scribble scrabbles, swastikas even began to appear, <clears throat> also a kind of a signature as the artist uh, you know, reminded everybody. But in fact, as every meter and a half section was covered, it was lowered <clears throat> from 12 meters you know, down to about six meters, you know, smaller, smaller between 1986 and 1993. It was finally sunk in November, <clears throat> November 9th, of course, another National Memorial Day in Germany. Uh, Christel knocked, <laughs> uh, the application of Wilhelm uh, won, uh, two, um, <clears throat> uh, Hitler's pooch, and, and also the day the wall came down uh, in Berlin in, in 1989. So on November 9th, 1993, this memorial was finally sunk, opening a space in the landscape for us to occupy, we become the only standing thing in this in this space. The space basically, um, this memorial has disappeared and returned the burden of memory to those of us who come before, look who come looking for it. In 1991, Jochen Gerritz went to teach at um, the Art Institute at Zarbrücken uh, and taught a memorial class in which he invited half of his students to go out and steal cobblestones from throughout the Zarbrücken, bring them back to the Schloss here, which had been the Gestapo headquarters during the war, um, replace the stones here, and take the replaced stones up to the classroom, where the other half of the students were busy researching every last uh, Jewish cemetery uh, in Germany between 1933 and 1945, destroyed by the Nazis, some 2,162. Uh, destroyed Jewish cemeteries. They carved the names of these destroyed Jewish cemeteries into the cobblestones and then under the cover of night replaced them here. But of course this was a Jochen Gertz production and so he replaced them inscribed side down. So when people go looking this is what they see. And of course the townspeople said well so where's the memorial? And the students replied simply that you have become the memorial for which you search. That is the only vertical figures in this square are the people looking for, for memory. Look within yourselves for the memory you want to find here. This is now called the, um, you know, the square of the invisible monument. Horst Holheisel um, in 1986, again, not knowing uh, about the, the Geertz's uh, memorial design in, uh, in Hamburg, you know, the sinking monument uh, proposed this negative form of memorial in Kassel to commemorate a fountain, uh, the Aschrodbrunnen, 
which was destroyed by the Nazis in 1938 because it had been donated to the uh, city of Kassel by a local Jewish philanthropist. Uh, they ended up filling it in with dirt and calling it Ashrod's grave. When the town wanted to commemorate you know, and maybe even resurrect the memorial, Hoheisel proposed taking the original form but turning it into the ground. So this was the model. And then putting a window on top, looking down into the original form so you could see it reflected. And instead of water coming up, you know, positively, um, as it once did as a fountain, the water now would fill this little channel and drain back down into the space so that you would only, you, you would get the sound of water falling, um, but the only standing figures on this square in front of the, the town hall would be the people now looking for such memory. <clears throat> So this is the uh, memorial to the Ashrod Brunnen in, in Kassel. But once again, this negative form memory, and, and just as uh, the Gerritsers were hoping to, you know, kind of return memory to those who come looking for it, um, Hoheisel proposed, or in his proposal, described how this would become a pedestal on which the rememberers would find themselves standing, thereby becoming, once again, the only vertical forms You know, look, look within yourselves. And finally, among these uh, German memorials, <coughs> um, a memorial by Misha Ullmann uh, to remember the book burnings on the Babelplatz in Berlin. Um, he proposed this memorial called Bibliothek or library, um, clearly to remember the books, you know, and the authors themselves. Um, but he didn't, you know, build a memorial to great fires or great piles of burning books <clears throat> or to the Nazis who, who burned them, but instead uh, created a, a space below, you see that middle window there, and then two, um, two steel tablets, uh, one engraved uh, with the description of the book burnings in March 1933, and the other, a simple quotation from Heinrich Heine, the great German Jewish poet, that said, um, where books are burned, so too one day will people be burned as well. The only standing forms on this square are the people uh, looking now down into the window at the memorial. And this is what they see, a room of empty bookshelves. <clears throat> the books are gone, the authors are gone, they cannot be replaced, they cannot be compensated. Absence will now be remembered by absence. The voids and loss will be remembered by further voids and further loss. And so this is why you know, the reporter asking me this question you know, was not completely wrong. Um, there was a vernacular of loss <laughs> and voids, um, kind of uh, unreconciled and unredeemable loss that completely preoccupied you know, this generation of, of young German artists. Um, Michel Ulmer, of course, an Israeli artist who'd been living in Germany for a while. And this is what he meant by, isn't this just another Holocaust memorial? This is Rachel White Rees memorial to the, on the Judenplatz in Vienna to Austria's murdered Jews. And very quickly, she had um, uh, proposed that materiality would be, you know, is somehow an index of absence. So she took the spaces between the leaves of a book and the wall in the library on which, in this, which these books would be set um, and would kind of turn that inside out so that she would have this very textured, as you see, almost like a cenotaph, but it would be representing only the spaces between the books and the walls, that is empty space. And this is after winning the Turner Prize in 1984. Uh, for filling a row house with concrete and then um, uh, taking away all the rest of the walls and the wood <clears throat> and, and stone, leaving only the space now articulated you know, by material. There's more to the story too, but um, again, just this, this preoccupation uh, with, with the empty spaces and how to articulate um, them without filling them in somehow. Shimon Ati, an American artist who moved to Berlin in 1990, <clears throat> just after the wall came down, um, was, was much preoccupied by what he didn't see. Uh, no sign of Jewish life in this neighborhood, in Schoenenviertel, which had been a neighborhood in Berlin full of um, uh, displaced and um, paperless Jews from uh, mostly Ostjuden or Eastern Jews uh, from Poland. 
And so he researched uh, all the photographs of this area, this neighborhood, um, and then turned these photographs into slides. And then without telling anybody under the cover of night, he projected the slides of these original places right back onto their original sites. This being kind of a, a Hebrew bookstore, another Hebrew bookstore, you know, creating this palimpsest. And again, reminding us all that these memorial sites depend completely on us coming and projecting onto them what's in our mind's eye and what's in Shimon's mind's eye here with the photographs he'd been researching of Jewish life here between the wars. So then we get to uh, 1997, <clears throat> um, the results of a, a gigantic competition for Germany's National Memorial to Europe's murdered Jews have been called off. The government had uh, called several symposia together and they invited me to come to the very last one and give kind of the last keynote. And it was at this keynote <clears throat> that I suggested that I wasn't sure um, Germany or anybody could actually respond to the German conundrum how to remember uh, murdered people you know, in the national name, um, how to uh, reunite the country on the bedrock memory of a national crime. Nobody would ever done it before. Maybe instead you should just have um, a thousand years of Holocaust memorial competitions than any final solution to your Holocaust memorial problem, I said. They said, um, thank you, I, I, kind of, I, I kind of put it in context, the, all the problems that we have in Israel and the United States and Poland uh, commemorating the Holocaust. And um, I got home back to the States and had a call uh, from the head of the Berlin Senate, Peter Rodunsky, who asked if I would join a new jury, a Findungskommission, they called it, to find a new model for Germany's Holocaust Memorial, uh, where Memorial to the Murder Jews of Europe. I said, well, you know, I, I don't really think it can be done. And he said, precisely because you don't think it can be done, uh, we would like you to be on this jury. I said, well, if you allow us to invite artists to articulate the question, you know, how to commemorate a murdered people in the national name, without answering that question, let's see if they can articulate it in their designs, then, um, then I would join you know, this jury. And he said, that's fine. And so we ended up uh, with three finalists. This one by Daniel Liebeskind. Uh, uh, the, the model is nice because you can see where the memorial was to be situated. <clears throat> um, but in fact, we, we felt that because he was the architect uh, of the Jewish Museum, <clears throat> we worried that he would somehow become responsible for all of Germany's national memory. And we really preferred, we would love to have seen a German actually um, get into the final you know, three. So the German who was in the final three was Gesina Weinmiller. <clears throat> and uh, she proposed this, this sunken, uh, you know, the sunken square. Um, it's a beautiful design. You can see that it is in some ways inspired by the uh, uh, Maya Lins Vietnam Veterans Memorial. You have to walk down into it. Um, in this space are 18 uh, scattered uh, sections of uh, limestone wall, uh, gigantic limestone blocks, the size of the ones of the Kotel, or the Western Wall in Jerusalem. 18, of course, uh, Hebrew Gramatria for high or life. And um, we noticed that as we walked along the, the parapet here to the right-hand corner, that these seemingly random you know, segments of wall composed themselves into a Star of David. And as we walked away, they kind of decomposed um, the Star of David, which was interesting, although we worried that it was, might be a little bit of a gimmick. But we liked this one a lot. And this one actually received um, three of five first place votes um, in our first vote. Um, but eventually it was between this one and uh, uh, Peter Eisenman and Richard Serra's uh, gigantic field of Stelle. Uh, we went back and forth, back and forth, and finally recommended um, the field of Stelle after several public, you know, very public uh, rancorous debates in which we asked uh, the artist uh, and the architect to scale this down. As originally propo proposed, there were 4,200 Stelle, ranging from ground level all the way to um, almost 30 feet, uh, 30 feet tall. 
and we worried about kids running out over the tops of them and falling and breaking their necks. Um, uh, you would go into this field, um, you go in so deep, you get, get lost. And that was part of the point. It was meant to be threatening and, and ominous, but not, but more metaphorically threatening. We didn't want it literally to be threatening and even fatal for visitors. So this was the space um, set aside for it. This is a, a great picture of that space, uh, how it existed before the wall came down. You see it was just behind the wall uh, on the Eastern side. <clears throat> the Brandenburger Tor is right there. And at the very tip of the, the East German flag there in the center uh, where, was, uh, where Hitler's bunker uh, was located and where Hitler's remains were found by the Red Army. It's really no man's land until the wall came down. And this was the space dedicated for it. So uh, Eisenman proposed scaling it down to 2,711 uh, Stelle um, and making it a much smaller. Uh, uh, Richard Serra hated that idea. He says, if you make it small, it's no longer my own. It's, it's somebody else's. You know, what I make is actually literally supposed to be dangerous. Um, and so Eisenman took it over, <clears throat> uh, proposed it, we proposed it to the Senate, Berlin Senate and to the Bundestag. Um, I described the debates in uh, a couple, a couple of my books, in, in fact, um, at, at Memory's Edge and also um, the Stages of Memory, um, in which it's very clear that every memorial is thereby kind of negotiated this way. <clears throat> um, we finally proposed uh, that the Bundestag vote on this memorial in three parts. Uh, first, yes, do you want a national memorial for Europe's murdered Jews in this site? Second, do you want Peter Eisenman's revised design? And third, do you want a place of information located underneath it? This place of information located underneath it uh, became really um, uh, one, of the, one of the greatest features. You know, as you see, these are very underdetermined. <clears throat> They're meant to be very abstract. There's no writing or anything on these. They're now more humanly proportioned. But as you walk into them, they do tower overhead. But it was the place of information built underneath that was very, very innovatively done. Dagmar von Wilken, the designer of the space beneath, um, created the illusion of the Stelle coming down into the memorials, uh, the museum space below, so that you've got this very abstract memorial above, anchored in very hard history below, a little bit of a yin and yang of um, history and memory abstract memory above, uh, anchored in this foundation of hard history on the walls below, um, which uh, clearly was inspiration eventually for us at the 9-11 uh, Memorial and Museum, uh, a museum which is also anchoring the abstract design of the reflecting poles above. So you can see where this, how this arc you know, is taking shape here. And the kids did walk out over the tops <clears throat> um, just as we feared they would. Let's see, we're gonna go <clears throat> quickly to the 9-11. So does this uh, uh, show up okay, Linda? I'll make sure, okay. Perfect, thank you. Can you see this? Yes, we can. Okay, so <clears throat> just a, um, as this memorial was now being uh, built between, you know, it being accepted in 1998 and finally unveiled in 2005, um, <clears throat> we had the 9-11 attacks in New York City, uh, Washington, D.C., <clears throat> um, actually Virginia, the Pentagon, and Shanksville, Pennsylvania, and I was asked within a couple of days of the attacks, actually, if I would come and uh, advise on how these attacks should be commemorated. And I said, they're not memory yet. Um, they're still unfolding history. I think maybe you need to look at the memorial, not as uh, 
uh, not as a kind of a finished product, but in its stages. <clears throat> yeah, with this in mind, let me. So you, can you see this memorial or, or this picture of the um, Twin Towers? With a gentleman jumping in between? No, now I'm... Uh, on, okay, now we're there. We'll trace our towers. Okay. <clears throat> and I said, rather than thinking of the memorial as a finished product, try to think of it in its stages. <clears throat> um, as it happened, how people received it, the, the, the horror in their faces uh, becoming the most terrifying kind of reflection of these attacks. Think of the memorial as beginning maybe with the candlelight vigils in Washington Square and Union Square, uh, the night of the attacks, you know, people coming, nobody told these people to come down and do this. They just knew that this is how you begin to commemorate, you know, the, such terrible loss very traditional you know, candlelight um, you know, vigil. The candle being a very traditional uh, response, uh, the flickering flame, the ephemerality of life, its fragility, uh, uh, the light keeping away the darkness, light and warmth together to, to reassure and console us. And then all the thousands and thousands of, of flyers uh, posted all over the city. Um, these two are part of the memorial. Think of these as, as the memorial. Think of these as, you know, kind of um, ephemeral uh, epitaphs. Have you seen my mother? Have you seen my father? Missing, lost, they didn't come home. All the all those place settings and tables around the city and New Jersey and the, and the surroundings, all the people who didn't come home that day. So this memorial motif of missingness and absence was really, um, baked into the very process. Um, nobody chose it, nobody told anybody to remember this way, but this motif was, was picked up almost immediately. Because in fact, um, as we discussed, you can't really have a memorial or in a memorial process without knowing the meaning of this memory. And the only people who had an absolute grasp on the meaning of these attacks were the families who lost loved ones. So this became yeah, these two became the memorial. And then all the stages, all the memorial vigils around the city, what was missing, the towers, what about the lives inside? And at first there was a conflation between lives lost and the towers lost. The firefighters knew exactly whom they had lost and nearly 400 firefighters who went down there to, to save people and who lost their lives in this act of civic courage. And we knew that they would be remembered slightly differently, but not sure how, but they, and they were. Lots of people wanted to preserve kind of the destruction, you know, as the memory of, of such loss. But in fact, um, said, don't remember, you know, the victims the way that the terrorists would have us remember them by this terrible debris of loss and great images of destruction. That part of the repair process and the cleanup process and the recovery process, these two are parts of the memorial. So think of the memorial in its long durée from the moment of the attacks to what we finally end up with and what we finally end up with, how that is received. And this was the same advice I had given you know, with, to the Argentinians, to people in Boston, to um, everybody in Germany as well. Just think of it as a process unfolding and don't worry too much about what it's going to end up as. Several emblems like the, you know, the tritons, you know, people want to leave those standing. The broken sphere, like Koenig. The the remaining this weird kind of um, a steel cross that the firefighters um, actually salvaged and have stored, and is now going to come back to the perimeter of the 9/11 uh, site memorial site. The twin beams of light, uh, tribute in light, which was first called, you know, of course. Um, uh, referring, you know, towers of light, referring to the buildings. And the family members said, no, it's got to remember the victims. So the, even the name of this was changed from towers of light to tribute in light, tribute to the victims. 
um, this is the six month anniversary of the attacks, March 11th, you know, 2002. And eventually, um, the very first anniversary was composed just of the family members reading the names of their lost loved ones. Again, a very traditional, uh, very traditional act. And by the first anniversary, the entire site had been cleared all the way down to bedrock. And the family members were invited to read their loved one's name. They were handed uh, a rose. And then they went down this giant ramp all the way to bedrock and cast the rose on this little tiny reflecting pole. This is the very first anniversary. So you can see how just as it, as it unfolds and people are trying to figure this out, you know, kind of, you know, on the move, that certain kinds of motifs are established. The water motif, uh, the flower motif, the names being read, this great absence. The rebuilding was going to begin. This was the very first, uh, the first, the, the last finalist of the, uh, re for rebuilding the Trade Center included this proposal by the Think Team, uh, Frederick Schwartz and, uh, and uh, Rafael Vignoli. Giant skeletal towers with office spaces just going up to the maybe the uh, 80th floor. The families hated it, the critics loved it. <clears throat> uh, Governor Pataki said it's too full of death. Therefore, but, but even as part of that, um, the Think Team had proposed this empty cube, uh, somewhat presciently, I think, to articulate the footprints of the towers. Two empty cubes. Taki chose this one uh, by Daniel Liebeskind, the asymmetrical spire echoing the Statue of Liberty torch, very prosaic. The families loved it. They identified with the story. Uh, critics weren't quite so sure, but of course this tower evolved like all towers and all memorials do. And we held the competition <clears throat> and um, the competition ended up resulting in uh, the winning design. This is uh, announcing the competition in April, 2003. Paula Grant Berry at the podium. Uh, her husband uh, died in the South Tower. You can see Maya Lin in the back row. <clears throat> Patty Harris, Deputy Mayor, Michael Van Valkenburg. Back there in the glasses, who had once chaired the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Design Committee, choosing the chose Maya Lin. They're all connected. This is all part of this, this memorial arc. 5,201 designs came in after over 13,800 uh, had registered. And we spent the next several months viewing 200 at a time. There were tears. We were, and we had weekly luncheons uh, with the mayor, with the governor. Here, um, the photograph is of the moment that we're asking Mayor Pataki, or sorry, Governor Pataki, um, to allow us to fail. <clears throat> so we need to be able to fail. If we can't find a design we can stand by and, and provide a complete rationale for, then we then we have to be allowed not to choose anything. And he. Agreed, in the end, we can't be forced to choose something from a defensive crouch. We need to be able to fail. Maya Lin, in particular, is concerned with this after he had made the executive decision you know, for the Libus Kid design. And he agreed. <clears throat> so we were then free to fail, which really set the stage for us to find something. Uh, the politics everywhere, I describe a lot of the, the politics and, and this kind of coming and going and how er every process is a very political process. Mayor Bloomberg gave us Gracie Mansion to use for the last couple of months. We invited the finalists in here. Long, long days, Gracie Mansion, uh, interviewing the finalists, uh, intervening, proposing changes. <clears throat> Much wine was drunk from Mayor Bloomberg's wine cellar. Of the three finalists, uh, we love this one. A French team proposed planting trees over the entire expanse, the very uh, elegiac uh, um, and pastoral notion of trees blooming in the spring, blossoming in the spring, coming into full 
growth in the summer, losing their leaves in the fall and going dormant in the winter, the cycle of life being repeated here. The footprints were to be articulated by a wildflower garden, but then the team got it more and more complicated. They added elements, several layers. They wanted to put a vitrine around the wild garden, uh, wildflower garden, <clears throat> um, and allow only uh, family members to enter it. But we love this idea of the pastoral elegy. Other finalists, a German team proposed the Memorial Cloud. Unfortunately, the Memorial Cloud was gorgeous to look at, but it reminded us, in fact, the only memorial logic it had was a reference to the, the toxic cloud um, that kind of hung over ground zero for several months after the attacks. <clears throat> Light would come through these glass tubes, lighting the names of each one of the victims. The footprints would be articulated in the sod. And eventually <clears throat> we got to Michael Rod's design, something that we actually loved. Sorry. Let's see here, I'm sorry. And I'll just finish here with um, how he wanted to articulate these footprints. <clears throat> Did, uh, do you have the picture of the drawing, the little pastel drawing? Yes. Think of the, the picture of Maya Lin I proposed. Michael Rod, uh, within just a, uh, a month or so of the attacks, envisioned a memorial which would be two gigantic voids in the harbor at Battery Park City in the water, 200 foot square voids that the water would be running down into. How we'd engineer it, he had no idea. There was no memorial competition yet. But this, he explained, was his inspiration, a kind of a, an epiphany he had. He even built kind of a, a, a water table on his rooftop from which he had watched the towers fall. and then proposed these two gigantic voids with waterfalls coming down, even galleries through which, from which you could watch the waterfall. We intervened, we wanted more life on the plaza. Uh, we didn't want to replicate the, the very inhospitable um, kind of uh, open, open space that the World Trade Center towers had, had become. Peter Walker came on board at the invitation of Michael Rod and proposed these beautiful um, abacus grid of trees uh, from east to west, that is, you know, left to right, they would be rows of trees replicating the city grid, but from north and south, you would see just random groves of trees. So you have this combination of nature and the city grid together, which we loved. And of course, one commemorating life <clears throat> and regeneration, the other commemorating loss that cannot be filled in. The water falls, but never, never fills in the void stuff behind in the landscape or in our hearts. On the 10th anniversary, they are unveiled. The names on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial were arranged brilliantly by Maya Lin <clears throat> to read uh, in the order in which uh, the soldiers fell. So really re-embedding the names in history. Michael Arad had a, a wonderful uh, way to arrange the names. Here at the 9-11 Memorial, he arranged them in what he called meaningful adjacencies. He asked every single family member, <clears throat> um, all family members, how they wanted their loved ones uh, to be um, in the company of somebody else. Who do you want your loved one to be, you know, to be by? And everybody gave their answers and they found an algorithm by which they could locate every single name in the company of those that the families wanted them to be, be nearby. The firefighters are remembered by uh, ladder company numbers next to their names. Uh, police officers and first responders are remembered by precinct numbers. And uh, 
this opened, as you see, on September 11th, 2011. The museum built beneath it um, is uh, really the history of the day. And so you literally have um, the museum space below defined by these gigantic voids above, just as we had um, in Berlin. And this is this, is this arc you know, I was um, uh, talking about. Um, all of art and architecture has been inflicted by memory of the Holocaust. This memorial now probably does inspire other Holocaust memorials. It's, it's um, the Dank Mall has inspired the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery in ways that I can show you maybe during the Q&A. Um, but for now, why don't I end and look forward to uh, hearing your questions. Uh, thanks so much for listening, everyone. Oh my, Professor Young, thank you. This has been an amazing journey to understand the challenges of um, articulating enormous grief and loss in public places and a real window into uh, that process. We do have some questions. I'm going to try to combine them um, for the sake of time. So the first one is, um, what would you say to those who argue that these type of memorials are um, too unreachable to the general public, that the divide between um, academic and everyday um, may uh, push towards the significance being lost. Sure. Um, I, think, I think there's a point uh, in that, in that um, you know, super abstract art um, is, can be a little bit cold. Um, I think Maya Lin has shown in the Vietnam Veterans Memorial that such abstract art also opens up the possibility for uh, intense visceral experience, you know, with, within, within it. And all this kind of, um, I mean, I, I would hate to bury the visceral experience of visiting these memorials beneath too much verbiage, uh, academic verbiage. I just, you know, notice when people you know, want to know, well, how did we get there? I mean, how, where'd this design come from? Or, and my, my point in my discussion of all these memorials, which began obviously my work on Holocaust memorials, is that sometimes the processes that bring them into being are just as interesting and valuable and enlightening as the finished design. When the finished design contains the elements of that which brought it into being, and invite the kind of contemplation and meditation and the site, a place that truly opens something within in us, you know, for the, you know, the space within us for memory. Um, we do kind of want to know why they work and why they work so well. It's very easy to talk about memorials that um, kind of work badly. I mean, the, the kind of unmemorable memorials. But I think these great ones, including the 9-11 Memorial, my Lynch Memorial, I think the Dank Mall is, is a great memorial, uh, despite its many controversies, and the new National Memorial for Peace and Justice in, in Montgomery, uh, Alabama, brilliantly um, uh, invokes uh, the Stelle uh, from, from Berlin, but instead of anchoring them in the ground, uh, they are hanging from the rafters above, they are reminding us of, of, of lynching. Both that and this memorial clearly depend on gravity, um, both, both, both both notions of the idea of gravity, the gravity that literally pulls things down and the, and the gravity, uh, the importance and seriousness of, of these sites. So it, we just need to allow for all of these parts of the process um, to be part of what we experience, I think, when, you know, in, in these sites. And if we visit memorials that leave us cold, that that's worth noting too. And um, uh, I'm sure that there are some abstract designs and there's some figurative designs that leave, leave some people cold. Great question. Good, thank you. Um, the next question is uh, if you would share your thoughts about uh, the people taking down historic monuments and statues right now as part of the uh, political landscape, we'll say. Sure. Um, I've always said that uh, we need to expand the life of the memorial or monument um, to include its prehistory, its construction, its coming into being, its reception, and even its eventual destruction. Um, the great example in 1989, of course, was the fall of all the Soviet era uh, monuments yeah, throughout the former Soviet Union, all the Lenins and Stalins you know, that came down. 
and what to do with them. <clears throat> um, when these monuments no longer, you know, have the um, um, no longer have the support of the people they're supposed to be talking to, um, they will almost come down by themselves. And you know, in the case of the Confederate monuments in this country, clearly they were not built, you know, by uh, survivors of the Confederacy. You know, they were built in Jim Crow era time to, um, to you know, to kind of throw Confederate white supremacy back in the face of civil rights marchers and the civil rights movement. And when that full history of these memorials becomes very evident, um, they will either live or die now by what they actually have come to represent. Um, part of the life of the Confederate these Confederate monuments will be their demise. Um, there are a bunch of Confederate monuments right now, which are being used as um, screens under which uh, Black Lives Matter uh, images are projected, uh, taken right out of Shimon Atis, uh, you know, a great work in Berlin. Um, we need to figure out what to do with the, these monuments and how they end. Um, how they remain in consciousness, but now recontextualized. Uh, do we leave the space empty with a story about what was once standing here and why it was taken down? So what they commemorate now is um, is the reason why they no longer speak to um, you know contemporary generation. And the contemporary monument makers are obsessed with creating spaces that will accommodate new generations' reasons for coming to them. Hence, you know, the, the, the very abstract monuments, which um, you know, do accommodate all kinds of new, you know, generations coming, you know, coming you know, to them. Um, people often ask me, well, what's the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum going to remember in 50 years? And the, the answer is, I don't know, but I know it's not going to be what it is now. It's going to be remembering other things as well. It's probably remembering something else completely. Wow, I never thought of that. Uh, thank you for that answer. Um, next question is uh, uh, more on the personal side for you. It is clear that you are passionate about this subject and deeply steeped in it. Uh, if you would share a little bit about how you were drawn to this particular study of, mem of memory and memorials with us. Um, yeah, I, th I thought about that a lot. <clears throat> and it really uh, came out of my research experience <clears throat> at uh, Auschwitz. Uh, during the early 80s, 1981, <clears throat> I went to Poland uh, to write the Polish section um, of my dissertation. Uh, it was a book on, uh, a dissertation on Holocaust literature. Um, I went to the museum uh, at Auschwitz <clears throat> where I was reading the Zoderkommando uh, scrolls diaries, which had been um, written in little Yiddish mouse print, rolled up and put in tin cans and buried next to the gas chamber and crematoria complexes found uh, several years after Auschwitz was liberated. So I'm there to read literature, but as these things were on the desk in front of me, I couldn't help but also begin to read and think about the spaces in which I was now reading these diaries. And my eyes went to the rooms, went to the landscape. I wandered outside the barbed wire fences. You know, I walked over to Beer Canal, and I realized that um, part of the narratives being created here are national narratives, and not just the narratives of you know, survivors and victims, but the narratives of entire nations. And that I needed to understand all the different ways that the Holocaust was being passed down to my generation via photographs, via diaries, via memorials and museums, films, photographs, painting. And um, this became my life's work, basically, understanding all the representations of the Holocaust, uh, but then moving into the spaces of memory to see exactly what and how these things, uh, how these things are built, and understanding that the, their genealogies, their prehistories, and how they came into being are, are just as important 
as uh, what they end up saying um, you know, in the end. And I wanted really to open up their stories to include all of these, you know, the long durée of memory uh, in all these texts and places. Beautiful, thank you. Uh, we have time for one more little question. Mm -hmm. And that is, um, if you uh, could share your opinion or thoughts about what should happen to these uh, monuments that are coming down and that are no longer speaking to people in the way they were intended. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, I, I would like to see them uh, stored in museums with new contexts. Um, if, if they're left standing, uh, they need to be accompanied by long captions explaining why they were made, uh, for whom they were supposedly speaking at the time, and, and how they you know, basically became obsolete. <clears throat> so that their obsolescence is, you know, is part of what is remembered you know, in these sites. But, but personally, I would like to see them uh, preserved you know, as, like, as museum artifacts, um, you know, cruel artifacts as they may be. Um, as, te as testimony and artifacts of the Jim Crow era and the lengths that uh, those monument makers uh, were going to preserve uh, their sense of the lost cause and white supremacy. Uh, thank you for that. I, our time is just about up, and, but I want to thank you so much for such an enlightening, interesting session and, and really sharing so much with us. I want to thank everybody who joined in today and ask you to please take a moment to fill out the survey for this program that you will find in a link to in the chat box. The survey helps us know how we're doing and gives us important information about what we can share with our, to share with our funders. Also, please know that the museum is now open on Wednesday through Sundays, 10 a.m. through 5 p.m. with the last entry at 4 p.m. Wednesdays are now free days throughout through the end of the year. And remember, no matter which day you plan on attending, please reserve your tickets online before arriving at the museum. And finally, check out our upcoming events on our events page and the link to that is also in the chat box. Really, Professor Young, I cannot thank you enough on behalf of everyone who's Pleasure. attending. And once again, thank you all for attending. Can't wait to see everybody back in, uh, in real time and real space in Chicago, Skokie. Take care. We'll, we'll look forward to having you here. <laughs> Bye-bye. Right. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh-huh. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.